interrupted, Bruce. I, I no, think, uh, thankfully, in Canada, we couldn't see this type of shutdown ever occur. But that is meant that symbolism is, of course, to draw attention to the fact that there is a, a cost in real terms to people's lives and their paychecks. And, uh, you know, I, I think, again, that's the backdrop here is we have to get, the United States has to get past this division and, and absolute loggerheads that have paralyzed the nation and can hurt the economy. Bruce? Something else happened, though, and I think it's really important to note that we had a 34-day shutdown, but it wasn't until the air traffic controllers didn't show up for flights coming into New York City. And so when that happened, then very quickly the shutdown was over. And so the power was in the people all along. They never realized they had as much power as they did. They went to work without pay until they didn't show up. And we all realized as Americans how important government workers are to us that it wasn't until that moment that things, you know, unraveled and we put everybody back to work. And so now that that genie's out of the bottle, I don't think we're going to get another shutdown like we had maybe ever again because yeah. people won't go to work. And I think that's the symbol also of this air traffic controller who actually brought the end to this shutdown. All right. Uh, the cabinet is making their way into the building now. Uh, the sergeant at arms has announced the cabinet. And then uh, within a few minutes, uh, within I would say in the next minute and a half, the house sergeant at arms will introduce the president of the United States. Peter McKay and Bruce Heyman, hold tight. We'll be right back to you. Great. Thank you. You are watching CBC News Network tonight, and we are just moments away from U.S. President Donald Trump giving his State of the Union address before Congress. Welcome back to this evening's special live programming of the State of the Union Address. I'm Carol McNeil. We want to welcome our online viewers this hour as we are being live streamed across our social media platforms, all of them, and we want to hear from you. Please send us any questions you want us to put to our panel. Reach us through CBC News Facebook. YouTube, Twitter, or Periscope. Joining us tonight to discuss the political and policy points the president is expected to make is Bruce Heyman, a former U.S. ambassador to Canada under President Barack Obama, and from Toronto, Peter McKay, former foreign affairs minister under Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Thank you both for your time and your insights this evening. Stand by. I just want to go to uh, Ellen Morrow in uh, Washington, who is at the Capitol tonight. Good evening. Ellen. Hi, Carol. We're just down the hall from the House of Representatives where President Trump will arrive uh, in the next few seconds to give his uh, address tonight. We've seen all of the lawmakers walk past us. It was really interesting uh, watching the senators walk into the House chamber because there were a lot of bipartisan conversations going on. We saw Lindsey Graham talking to Kamala Harris, uh, for example, and we know that President Trump tonight will make calls for unity. He will make calls for bipartisanship in this address, but those could be uh, really hard messages to sell given we're fresh off the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. And for the first time, he's going to be speaking to a divided Congress looking at out at dozens of newly elected Democrats who ran in opposition to President Trump. So it's a tougher crowd than he had this time last year. We know he's going to talk about uh, immigration, which is really his landmark issue. He's going to again make the case for that border wall with Mexico. And if you recall, uh, Congress really only has until February 15th to come up with some kind of solution on the wall issue to avoid yet another government shutdown. So that is the backdrop for tonight's speech as we await for President Trump's arrival. All right. And that could happen at any moment. That is Melania Trump. Uh, Bruce Heyman, a very different political landscape Donald Trump finds himself in this Congress. Very different. I, he spent the first two years of his presidency virtually sense. getting everything passed that he wanted. And so because he controlled the House and the Senate, and he threw Democrats under the bus for two straight years. Now Democrats have been in charge of the House for about three weeks now. And he's calling for let's all get together and be friends Sorry? and this is all going to oh. be good. All right. So, stand, uh, stand by. The House Sergeant at Arms is going to introduce the president. Yes.
Peter, what do you think of the introduction he's getting so far? Well, it appears that there's a lot of enthusiasm there, uh, clearly a lot at stake tonight. One of the interesting little side notes is, is who's not there. As you know, they have a designated survivor. This goes back to their constitution where a member of the cabinet usually is in a distant and secret location. But I think you're seeing right now a lot of anticipation and a, a demonstration in support for the office for support for the, the importance of this occasion and the pomp and ceremony that comes with it. And so that's very much part of the, the build-up to what we're yeah. seeing right now. Energy Secretary Rick Perry is the designated survivor tonight. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, what do you make of the introduction and the reception that uh, the president is getting tonight, Bruce? Every single person in that room loves the United States of America and wants to do things that I believe help the country. They have different philosophies and different policies. And this is a coming together of our entire government at every level, with the exception of Rick Perry. And everybody's coming together to, to rally around the United States of America. Now, that doesn't mean they agree with all the policies of each other, but they do support our country. Peter, Stephen Harper led two of the longest lasting minority led governments in Canadian history. Do you see Donald Trump working with Nancy Pelosi during the second half of this term? Well, one would hope so. And there are going to be many points of contact and probably points of conflict, uh, but it is going to take tremendous effort on his part okay. and a willingness to put water in the wine. Well, let's see what's going to happen. He is handing over the speech. Let's listen. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, the First Lady of the United States, And my fellow Americans, we meet tonight at a moment of unlimited potential. As we begin a new Congress, I stand here ready to work with you to achieve historic breakthroughs for all Americans. Millions of our fellow citizens are watching us now gathered in this great chamber, hoping that we will govern not as two parties, but as one nation. The agenda I will lay out this evening is not a Republican agenda or a Democrat agenda. It's the agenda of the American people. Many of us have campaigned on the same core promises to defend American jobs and demand fair trade for American workers. 
to rebuild and revitalize our nation's infrastructure, to reduce the price of health care and prescription drugs, to create an immigration system that is safe, lawful, modern, and secure, and to pursue a foreign policy that puts America's interest first. There is a new opportunity in American politics if only we have the courage together to seize it. Victory is not winning for our party. Victory is winning for our country. This year, America will recognize two important anniversaries that show us the majesty of America's mission and the power of American pride. In June, we mark 75 years since the start of what General Dwight D. Eisenhower called the Great Crusade, the Allied liberation of Europe in World War II. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, 15,000 young American men jumped from the sky, and 60,000 more stormed in from the sea to save our civilization from tyranny. Here with us tonight are three of those incredible heroes. Private First Class Joseph Riley, Staff Sergeant Irving Locker, and Sergeant Herman Zeitschek. Gentlemen, we salute you. In 2019, we also celebrate 50 years since brave young pilots flew a quarter of a million miles through space to plant the American flag on the face of the moon. Half a century later, we are joined by one of the Apollo 11 astronauts who planted that flag Buzz Aldrin. Thank you, Buzz. This year, American astronauts will go back to space on American rockets. In the 20th century, America saved freedom, transformed science, redefined the middle class. And when you get down to it, there's nothing anywhere in the world that can compete with America.
now we must step boldly and bravely into the next chapter of this great American adventure, and we must create a new standard of living for the 21st century, an amazing quality of life for all of our citizens is within reach. We can make our community safer, our family stronger, our culture richer, our faith deeper, and our middle class bigger and more prosperous than ever before. But we must reject the politics of revenge, resistance, and retribution, and embrace the boundless potential of cooperation, compromise, and the common good. Together, we can break decades of political stalemate. We can bridge old divisions, heal old wounds, build new coalitions, forge new solutions, and unlock the extraordinary promise of America's future. The decision is ours to make. We must choose between greatness or gridlock, results or resistance, vision or vengeance, incredible progress or pointless destruction. Tonight, I ask you to choose greatness. Over the last two years, my administration has moved with urgency and historic speed to confront problems neglected by leaders of both parties over many decades. In just over two years since the election, we have launched an unprecedented economic boom, a boom that has rarely been seen before. There's been nothing like it. We have created 5.3 million new jobs and importantly, added 600,000 new manufacturing jobs, something which almost everyone said was impossible to do. But the fact is, we are just getting started. Wages are rising at the fastest pace in decades and growing for blue-collar workers who I promise to fight for. They're growing faster than anyone else thought possible. Nearly 5 million Americans have been lifted off food stamps. The U.S. economy is growing almost twice as fast today as when I took office. And we are considered far and away the hottest economy anywhere in the world, not even close. <laughs> Unemployment has reached the lowest rate in over half a century. African American, Hispanic American, and Asian American unemployment have all reached their lowest levels ever recorded. <laughs> Un
Unemployment for Americans with disabilities has also reached an all-time low. More people are working now than at any time in the history of our country. 157 million people at work. We passed a massive tax cut for working families and doubled the child tax credit. We virtually ended the estate tax, or death tax, as it is often called, on small businesses, for ranches, and also for family farms. We eliminated the very unpopular Obamacare individual mandate penalty. And you give critically ill patients access to life-saving cures, we passed, very importantly, Right to Try. My administration has cut more regulations in a short period of time than any other administration during its entire tenure. Companies are coming back to our country in large numbers, thanks to our historic reductions in taxes and regulations. And we have unleashed a revolution in American energy. The United States is now the number one producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world. And now, for the first time in 65 years, we are a net exporter of energy. After 24 months of rapid progress, our economy is the envy of the world. Our military is the most powerful on Earth by far. And America — America is again winning each and every day. Members of Congress, the state of our union is strong. That sounds so good. <laughs> our country is vibrant, and our economy is thriving like never before. On Friday, it was announced that we added another 304,000 jobs last month alone, almost double the number expected.
An economic miracle is taking place in the United States, and the only thing that can stop it are foolish wars, politics, or ridiculous partisan investigations. If there is going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. It just doesn't work that way. We must be united at home to defeat our adversaries abroad. This new era of cooperation can start with finally confirming the more than 300 highly qualified nominees who are still stuck in the Senate, in some cases, years and years waiting. Not right. The Senate has failed to act on these nominations, which is unfair to the nominees and very unfair to our country. Now is the time for bipartisan action. Believe it or not, we have already proven that that's possible. In the last Congress, both parties came together to pass unprecedented legislation to confront the opioid crisis, a sweeping new farm bill, historic VA reforms, and after four decades of rejection, we passed VA accountability so that we can finally terminate those who mistreat our wonderful veterans. And just weeks ago, both parties united for groundbreaking criminal justice reform. They said it couldn't be done. Last year, I heard through friends the story of Alice Johnson. I was deeply moved. In 1997, Alice was sentenced to life in prison as a first-time nonviolent drug offender. Over the next 22 years, she became a prison minister, inspiring others to choose a better path. She had a big impact on that prison population and far beyond. Alice's story underscores the disparities and unfairness that can exist in criminal sentencing and the need to remedy this total injustice. She served almost that 22 years and had expected to be in prison for the remainder of her life. In June, I commuted Alice's sentence. When I saw Alice's beautiful family greet her at the prison gates, hugging and kissing and crying and laughing, I knew I did something right. Alice is with us tonight and she is a terrific woman. Terrific. Alice, please.
Alice, thank you for reminding us that we always have the power to shape our own destiny. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you very much. Inspired by stories like Alice's, my administration worked closely with members of both parties to sign the First Step Act into law. Big deal. It's a big deal. This legislation reformed sentencing laws that have wrongly and disproportionately harmed the African-American community. The First Step Act gives nonviolent offenders the chance to reenter society as productive, law-abiding citizens. Now, states across the country are following our lead. America is a nation that believes in redemption. We are also joined tonight by Matthew Charles from Tennessee. In 1996, at the age of 30, Matthew was sentenced to 35 years for selling drugs and related offenses. Over the next two decades, he completed more than 30 Bible studies, became a law clerk, and mentored many of his fellow inmates. Now Matthew is the very first person to be released from prison under the First Step Act. Matthew, please. Thank you, Matthew. Welcome home. Now, Republicans and Democrats must join forces again to confront an urgent national crisis. Congress has 10 days left to pass a bill that will fund our government protect our homeland, and secure our very dangerous southern border. Now is the time for Congress to show the world that America is committed to ending illegal immigration and putting the ruthless coyotes, cartels, drug dealers, and human traffickers out of business. speak, large, organized caravans are on the march to the United States. We have just heard that Mexican cities, in order to remove the illegal immigrants from their communities, are getting trucks and buses to bring them up to our country in areas where there is little border protection. I have ordered another 3,750 troops to our southern border to prepare for this tremendous onslaught. This is a moral issue. The lawless state of our southern border is a threat to the safety, security, and financial well-being of all America. We have a moral duty to create an immigration system that protects the lives and jobs of our citizens. This includes our obligation to the millions of immigrants living here today who followed the rules and respected our laws. Legal immigrants enrich our nation and strengthen our society in countless ways. I 
I want people to come into our country in the largest numbers ever, but they have to come in legally. Tonight, I am asking you to defend our very dangerous southern border out of love and devotion to our fellow citizens and to our country. No issue better illustrates the divide between America's working class and America's political class than illegal immigration. Wealthy politicians and donors push for open borders while living their lives behind walls and gates and guards. <laughs> Meanwhile, working-class Americans are left to pay the price for mass illegal immigration reduced jobs, lower wages, overburdened schools, hospitals that are so crowded you can't get in, increased crime, and a depleted social safety net. Tolerance for illegal immigration is not compassionate. It is actually very cruel. One in three women is sexually assaulted on the long journey north. Smugglers use migrant children as human pawns to exploit our laws and gain access to our country. Human traffickers and sex traffickers take advantage of the wide open areas between our ports of entry to smuggle thousands of young girls and women into the United States and to sell them into prostitution and modern-day slavery. Tens of thousands of innocent Americans are killed by lethal drugs that cross our border and flood into our cities, including meth, heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. The savage gang, MS-13, now operates in at least 20 different American states, and they almost all come through our southern border. Just yesterday, an MS-13 gang member was taken into custody for a fatal shooting on a subway platform in New York City. We are removing these gang members by the thousands. But until we secure our border, they're going to keep streaming right back in. Year after year, countless Americans are murdered by criminal, illegal aliens. I've gotten to know many wonderful angel moms and dads and families. No one should ever have to suffer the horrible heartache that they have had to endure. Here tonight is Deborah Bissell. Just three weeks ago, Deborah's parents, Gerald and Sharon, were burglarized and shot to death in their Reno, Nevada home by an illegal alien. They were in their 80s and are survived by four children, 11 grandchildren, and 20 great-grandchildren. Also here tonight are Gerald and Sharon's granddaughter, Heather, and great-granddaughter, Madison. To Deborah, Heather, Madison, please stand. Few can understand your pain. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much.
I will never forget, and I will fight for the memory of Gerald and Sharon, that it should never happen again. Not one more American life should be lost because our nation failed to control its very dangerous border. In the last two years, our brave ICE officers made 266,000 arrests of criminal aliens, including those charged or convicted of nearly 100,000 assaults, 30,000 sex crimes, and 4,000 killings or murders. We are joined tonight by one of those law enforcement heroes, ICE Special Agent Elvin Hernandez. When Elvin When Elvin was a boy, he and his family legally immigrated to the United States from the Dominican Republic. At the age of eight, Elvin told his dad he wanted to become a special agent. Today, he leads investigations into the scourge of international sex trafficking. Elvin says that if I can Make sure these young girls get their justice. I've really done my job. Thanks to his work and that of his incredible colleagues, more than 300 women and girls have been rescued from the horror of this terrible situation. And more than 1,500 sadistic traffickers have been put behind bars. Thank you, Ryan. We will always support the brave men and women of law enforcement. And I pledge to you tonight that I will never abolish our heroes from ICE. Thank you. My administration has sent to Congress a common-sense proposal to end the crisis on the southern border. It includes humanitarian assistance, more law enforcement, drug detection at our ports, closing loopholes that enable child smuggling, and plans for a new physical barrier or wall to secure the vast areas between our ports of entry. In the past, most of the people in this room voted for a wall. But the proper wall never got built. I will get it built. This is a smart, strategic, see-through steel barrier not just a simple concrete wall. It will be deployed in the areas identified by the border agents as having the greatest need. And these agents will tell you where walls go up, illegal crossings go way, way down. San Diego used to have the most illegal border crossings in our country. In response, a strong security wall was put in place. This powerful barrier 
almost completely ended illegal crossings. The border city of El Paso, Texas, used to have extremely high rates of violent crime, one of the highest in the entire country, and considered one of our nation's most dangerous cities. Now, immediately upon its building, with a powerful barrier in place, El Paso is one of the safest cities in our country. Simply put, walls work and walls save lives. So let's work together, compromise, and reach a deal that will truly make America safe. As we work to defend our people's safety, we must also ensure our economic resurgence continues at a rapid pace. No one has benefited more from our thriving economy than women who have filled 58 percent of the newly created jobs last year. You weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All Americans can be proud that we have more women in the workforce than ever before. Don't sit yet. You're going to like this. <laughs> and exactly one century after Congress passed the constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote, we also have more women serving in Congress than at any time before. That's great. Very great. And congratulations. That's great. As part of our commitment to improving opportunity for women everywhere, this Thursday, we are launching the first-ever government-wide initiative focused on economic empowerment for women in developing countries. To build on — thank you. To build on our incredible economic success, one priority is paramount — reversing decades of calamitous trade policies. So bad. We are now making it clear to China that after years of targeting our industries and stealing our intellectual property, the theft of American jobs and wealth has come to an end.
Therefore, we recently imposed tariffs on $250 billion of Chinese goods, and now our Treasury is receiving billions and billions of dollars. But I don't blame China for taking advantage of us. I blame our leaders and representatives for allowing this travesty to happen. I have great respect for President Xi, and we are now working on a new trade deal with China. But it must include real structural change to end unfair trade practices, reduce our chronic trade deficit, and protect American jobs. Another historic trade blunder was the catastrophe known as NAFTA. I have met the men and women of Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, New Hampshire, and many other states whose dreams were shattered by the signing of NAFTA. For years, politicians promised them they would renegotiate for a better deal. But no one ever tried until now. Our new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, the USMCA, will replace NAFTA and deliver for American workers like they haven't had delivered to for a long time. I hope you can pass the USMCA into law so that we can bring back our manufacturing jobs in even greater numbers expand American agriculture, protect intellectual property, and ensure that more cars are proudly stamped with our four beautiful words, made in the USA. Tonight, I am also asking you to pass the United States Reciprocal Trade Act so that if another country places an unfair tariff on an American product, we can charge them the exact same tariff on the exact same product that they sell to us. Both parties should be able to unite for a great rebuilding of America's crumbling infrastructure. I know that Congress is eager to pass an infrastructure bill. And I am eager to work with you on legislation to deliver new and important infrastructure investment, including investments in the cutting-edge industries of the future. This is not an option. This is a necessity. The next major priority for me and for all of us should be to lower the cost of health care and prescription drugs, and to protect patients with pre-existing conditions. Already as a result of my administration's efforts in 2018, Drug prices experienced their single largest decline in 46 years. But we must do more. It's unacceptable that Americans pay vastly more than people in other countries for the exact same drugs often made in the exact same place. This is wrong. This is unfair. 
And together, we will stop it. And we'll stop it fast. I am asking Congress to pass legislation that finally takes on the problem of global freeloading and delivers fairness and price transparency for American patients, finally. We should also require drug companies, insurance companies, and hospitals to disclose real prices to foster competition and bring costs way down. No force in history has done more to advance the human condition than American freedom. In recent years, In recent years, we have made remarkable progress in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Scientific breakthroughs have brought a once distant dream within reach. My budget will ask Democrats and Republicans to make the needed commitment to eliminate the HIV epidemic in the United States within 10 years. We have made incredible strides. Incredible. <laughs> Together, we will defeat AIDS in America and beyond. Tonight, I am also asking you to join me in another fight that all Americans can get behind, the fight against childhood cancer. <laughs> Joining Melania in the gallery this evening, is a very brave 10-year-old girl, Grace Eline. Every birthday, Hi, Grace. <laughs> Every birthday since she was four, Grace asked her friends to donate to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. She did not know that one day she might be a patient herself. That's what happened. Last year, Grace was diagnosed with brain cancer. Immediately, she began radiation treatment. At the same time, she rallied her community and raised more than $40,000 for the fight against cancer. When Grace completed treatment last fall, her doctors and nurses cheered. They loved her. They still love her. With tears in their eyes as she hung up a poster that read, Last Day of Chemo.
Thank you very much, Grace. You are a great inspiration to everyone in this room. Thank you very much. Many childhood cancers have not seen new therapies in decades. My budget will ask Congress for $500 million over the next 10 years to fund this critical life-saving research to help support working parents. The time has come to pass school choice for Americans' children. I'm also proud to be the first President to include in my budget a plan for nationwide paid family leave so that every new parent has the chance to bond with their newborn child. There could be no greater contrast to the beautiful image of a mother holding her infant child than the chilling displays our nation saw in recent days. Lawmakers in New York cheered with delight upon the passage of legislation that would allow a baby to be ripped from the mother's womb moments from birth. These are living, feeling, beautiful babies who will never get the chance to share their love and their dreams with the world. And then we had the case of the governor of Virginia, where he stated he would execute a baby after birth to defend the dignity of every person. I am asking Congress to pass legislation to prohibit the late term abortion of children who can feel pain in the mother's womb. Let us work together to build a culture that cherishes innocent life. And let us reaffirm a fundamental truth. All children, born and unborn, are made in the holy image of God. The final part of my agenda is to protect American security. Over the last two years, we have begun to fully rebuild the United States military with $700 billion last year and $716 billion this year. We are also getting other nations to pay their fair share. Finally. For years, the United States was being treated very unfairly by friends of ours, members of NATO. But now we have secured, over the last couple of years, more than $100 billion of increase in defense spending from our NATO allies. They said it couldn't be done. As part of our military buildup, the United States is developing a state-of-the-art missile defense system. 
under my administration, we will never apologize for advancing America's interests. For example, decades ago, the United States entered into a treaty with Russia in which we agreed to limit and reduce our missile capability. While we followed the agreement and the rules to the letter, Russia repeatedly violated its terms. It's been going on for many years. That is why I announced that the United States is officially withdrawing from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF Treaty. Perhaps We really have no choice. Perhaps we can negotiate a different agreement, adding China and others. Or perhaps we can't, in which case we will outspend and out-innovate all others by far. As part of a bold new diplomacy, we continue our historic push for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Our hostages have come home. Nuclear testing has stopped. And there has not been a missile launch in more than 15 months. If I had not been elected President of the United States, we would right now, in my opinion, be in a major war with North Korea. Much work remains to be done, but my relationship with Kim Jong-un is a good one. Chairman Kim and I will meet again on February 27th and 28th in Vietnam. Two weeks ago, the United States officially recognized the legitimate government of Venezuela and its new president, Juan Guaido. We stand with the Venezuelan people in their noble quest for freedom and we condemn the brutality of the Maduro regime, whose socialist policies have turned that nation from being the wealthiest in South America into a state of abject poverty and despair. Here in the United States, we are alarmed by the new calls to adopt socialism in our country. America was founded on liberty and independence, and not government coercion, domination, and control. We are born free, and we will stay free. Tonight, we renew our resolve that America will never be a socialist country. One of the most complex set of challenges we face and have for many years is in the Middle East. Our approach is based on principle realism, 
not discredited theories that have failed for decades to yield progress. For this reason, my administration recognized the true capital of Israel and proudly opened the American Embassy in Jerusalem. Our brave troops have now been fighting in the Middle East for almost 19 years. In Afghanistan and Iraq, nearly 7,000 American heroes have given their lives. More than 52,000 Americans have been badly wounded. We have spent more than $7 trillion in fighting wars in the Middle East. As a candidate for president, I loudly pledged a new approach. Great nations do not fight endless wars. When I took office, ISIS controlled more than 20,000 square miles in Iraq and Syria just two years ago. Today, we have liberated virtually all of the territory from the grip of these bloodthirsty monsters. Now, as we work with our allies to destroy the remnants of ISIS, it is time to give our brave warriors in Syria a warm welcome home. I have also accelerated our negotiations to reach, if possible, a political settlement in Afghanistan. The opposing side is also very happy to be negotiating. Our troops have fought with unmatched valor, and thanks to their bravery, we are now able to pursue a possible political solution to this long and bloody conflict. In Afghanistan, my administration is holding constructive talks with a number of Afghan groups, including the Taliban. As we make progress in these negotiations, we will be able to reduce our troops' presence and focus on counterterrorism, and we will indeed focus on counterterrorism. We do not know whether we'll achieve an agreement, but we do know that after two decades of war, the hour has come to at least try for peace, and the other side would like to do the same thing. It's time. <laughs> Above all, friend and foe alike must never doubt this nation's power and will to defend our people. Eighteen years ago, violent terrorists attacked the USS Cole, and last month, American forces killed one of the leaders of that attack. We are honored to be joined tonight by Tom Wibberley, whose son, Navy Seaman Craig Wibberley, was one of the 17 sailors we tragically lost. 
Tom, we vow to always remember the heroes of the USS Cole. Thank you, Tom. My administration has acted decisively to confront the world's leading state sponsor of terror, the radical regime in Iran. It is a radical regime. They do bad, bad things. To ensure this corrupt dictatorship never acquires nuclear weapons, I withdrew the United States from the disastrous Iran nuclear deal. And last fall, we put in place the toughest sanctions ever imposed by us on a country. We will not avert our eyes from a regime that chants death to America and threatens genocide against the Jewish people. We must never ignore the vile poison of anti-Semitism or those who spread its venomous creed. With one voice, we must confront this hatred anywhere and everywhere it occurs. Just months ago, 11 Jewish Americans were viciously murdered in an anti-Semitic attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. SWAT officer Timothy Matson raced into the gunfire and was shot seven times chasing down the killer, and he was very successful. Timothy has just had his 12th surgery, and he's going in for many more. But he made the trip to be here with us tonight. Officer Matson, please. Thank you. We are forever grateful. Thank you very much. Tonight, we are also joined by Pittsburgh survivor Judah Sabbat. He arrived at the synagogue as the massacre began. But not only did Judah narrowly escape death last fall, more than seven decades ago, he narrowly survived the Nazi concentration camps. Today is Judah's 81st birthday.
They wouldn't do that for me, Judah. <laughs> Judah says he can still remember the exact moment nearly 75 years ago, after 10 months in a concentration camp, when he and his family were put on a train and told they were going to another camp. Suddenly, the train screeched to a very strong halt. A soldier appeared. Judah's family braced for the absolute worst. Then his father cried out with joy, it's the Americans, it's the Americans. Thank you. A second Holocaust survivor who is here tonight, Joshua Kaufman, was a prisoner at Dachau. He remembers watching through a hole in the wall of a cattle car as American soldiers rolled in with tanks. To me, Joshua recalls, the American soldiers were proof that God exists and they came down from the sky. They came down from heaven. I began this evening by honoring three soldiers who fought on D-Day in the Second World War. One of them was Hermann Zajcik. But there is more to Hermann's story. A year after he stormed the beaches of Normandy, Hermann was one of the American soldiers who helped liberate Dachau. He was one of the Americans who helped rescue Joshua from that hell on Earth. Almost 75 years later, Herman and Joshua are both together in the gallery tonight, seated side by side here in the home of American freedom. Herman and Joshua, your presence this evening is very much Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. When American soldiers set out beneath the dark skies over the English Channel in the early hours of D-Day, 1944, they were just young men of 18 and 19 hurtling on fragile landing craft toward the most momentous battle in the history of war. They did not know if they would survive the hour they did not know if they would grow old, but they knew that America had to prevail. Their cause was this nation and generations yet unborn. Why did they do it? They did it for America. They did it for us. Everything that has come since our triumph over communism, our giant leaps of science and discovery, our unrivaled progress towards equality and justice, 
All of it is possible thanks to the blood and tears and courage and vision of the Americans who came before. Think of this capital. Think of this very chamber where lawmakers before you voted to end slavery, to build the railroads and the highways, and defeat fascism, to secure civil rights, and to face down evil empires. Here tonight, we have legislators from across this magnificent republic. You have come from the rocky shores of Maine and the volcanic peaks of Hawaii, from the snowy woods of Wisconsin and the red deserts of Arizona, from the green farms of Kentucky and the golden beaches of California. Together, we represent the most extraordinary nation in all of history. What will we do with this moment? How will we be remembered? I ask the men and women of this Congress, look at the opportunities before us. Our most thrilling achievements are still ahead. Our most exciting journeys still await. Our biggest victories are still to come. We have not yet begun to dream. We must choose whether we are defined by our differences or whether we dare to transcend them. We must choose whether we squander our great inheritance or whether we proudly declare that we are Americans. We do the incredible. We defy the impossible. We conquer the unknown. This is the time to reignite the American imagination. This is the time to search for the tallest summit and set our sights on the brightest star. This is the time to rekindle the bonds of love and loyalty and memory that link us together as citizens, as neighbors, as patriots. This is our future, our fate, and our choice to make. I am asking you to choose greatness. No matter the trials we face, no matter the challenges to come, we must go forward together. We must keep America first in our hearts. We must keep freedom alive in our souls. And we must always keep faith in America's destiny. That one nation, under God, must be the hope and the promise and the light and the glory among all the nations of the world. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there you have it. The U.S. President's State of the Union Address 2019, the economy, the request for a wall against Mexico, trade with Canada and the U.S., the problems with China, abortion legislation, success of women in politics, pharmacare, nationwide family leave plan, the governor of Virginia, democratic investigations, Venezuela, North Korea, the Middle East, Syria, Iran and Israel, and Afghanistan, and nuclear treaties with Russia. Let's talk about it. With me tonight is Bruce Heyman. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Canada under President Barack Obama. And from Toronto, Peter McKay. He's a former foreign affairs minister under Prime Minister Stephen Harper. We'll continue to watch uh, what's happening in the chamber. Peter McKay, what did you think of the speech? Well, he covered the waterfront. I mean, he touched on so many subjects tonight. The, uh, he ended with a flourish, almost Obama-esque. 
And he, there, were, there was a number of, of very interesting moments where he juxtaposed some of the visionary pieces, child care, child cancer care, uh, going after AIDS as an epidemic, looking to improve the, the economy even further for more opportunities for uh, African Americans, Hispanic and, and, uh, and Asian Americans. And yet there was also some other very negative themes that you, you referenced, in, including the wall, yeah. uh, including you know, his, his references to trying to go into the, the realm of partisan politics, shut down the investigation. He also signaled something which is a little bit worrisome, mm -hmm. and that was you know, withdrawing from international arms treaties, and that he would, in essence, outspend any other country when it came to an escalation of arms or an, an arms race. This is uh, almost uh, like the Reagan era where he has signaled very clearly that he is going to build up the U.S. military. So there were all kinds of moments in time where there, people were getting to their feet, even, even Democrats and, and, uh, and those who were there in the gallery other times where you could see it on their faces and certainly on Nancy Pelosi's face it was uh, sometimes a cross between disdain and disinterest she was mm. having I think a, a difficult time containing some even, of her emotions she didn't even introduce him Bruce no that didn't happen yeah so so look my, my sense of this is exactly that it covered the waterfront you know he touched he pulled all the heartstrings that you'd want to pull especially for his base he really hit a lot of things that I think his base will, will probably like in, in, in this presentation. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, you have to sit down and just pull back a minute, especially everyone in Canada. The United States and every administration prior from World War II, prior to Donald Trump, had very much a multilateral approach. That multilateral approach meant that Canada, you're with us, let's go do things around the world. Let's go do things in Europe and Africa and in our continent. This president has a unilateral approach. This president thinks in terms of America's greatness means everything should be America first. Prior presidents, and this person sitting right here, will tell you that what makes America great is when we work together with our allies, when we work together with Canada, when we work together with our European allies and allies in Asia and around the world. And this president continued to emphasize the what makes America great. That's what we're going to do. Now, the second part that disturbed me so much was, and, and it was just so unsettling, is using people as props, human props for this wall. And, you know, let's be realistic about the kinds of things that we're facing in America. First of all, he has greatly exaggerated the risks that are happening here. In fact, what people crossing our southern border are, are only one quarter of the level that we saw in the year 2000. And the level of crime that we see from immigrants in the United States is below what we're seeing from people born in the United States. We have gun violence in the United States. 40,000 people were killed by guns in the United States this last year. That's a crisis. But what he has done in taking families and individuals who were impacted by immigrants who killed somebody and then holding them up to build a wall, that was just shameful. And it was deeply unsettling for me, especially for a person who has his government has separated children from women at our border this last week. They have announced that they can't even account for the thousands of children that they may have separated because it would be too hard to count them. And so I'm very upset about this wall and this process, but the fact of the matter is Congress isn't going to give him the money. He's going to go try to rush this through in some way. He said to everybody right there, I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. And so we're going to have a, 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 an inflection point, and it's probably 10 days away now whether the government shuts down or whether he declares a national emergency. But something's coming in 10 days, 
he has foreshadowed that pretty clearly for everybody. Yeah. Uh, the, the Peter McKay, what do you think of the people that he used um, in his speech, as others have done before? And we have questions from the public that, you know, uh, uh, Bruce, maybe you can speak to this, and then, Peter, I'll, I'll come to you about your opinion on using it. But, but it's common for presidents to pepper their speech with examples of people who represent what they want to, what they want to make clear their policies are to the public. So, um, military heroes, this is something that is, you know, universal. We, you know, we love our military heroes in our country. Cancer victims pulls at the heartstrings. That is a nonpartisan issue. Fighting AIDS and doing these things. I mean, that, that is all, I think, you know, helps galvanize people to, for a better cause for our country. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're using individual families, to do something in which you already know that the American people don't want this wall, Congress has already told you they're not going to fund this wall, and the facts aren't with him at all, but then using these families as props, human yeah. props for this, that was very unsettling for me. Yeah, on online, by the way, uh, online, that was the one area that stood out for the fact checkers where he was consistently wrong. And he's been pointed out to be wrong in the past, but um, it apparently didn't have much of an impact on the speech tonight. Right. Peter, what did you think? Well, I, I think, as the ambassador said, this is not a new approach to have people in the gallery. I, I thought certainly the choice of D-Day veterans and the image of the storming of, of the beaches and then the liberation of Dachau and, and the, the Holocaust uh, invocation of memory is, is something that is going to galvanize. There's no question. Having a, an ICE uh, official there to, to tie into the, the narrative about the necessity for a wall. I think, you know, the president is in a position where I saw glimmers of hope that perhaps he was looking for an off-ramp. Perhaps there was some conciliatory way forward. The coming days will, will tell. Uh, but this, this idea of having persons embody these particular images and, and throughout the speech continually having them stand and be recognized is an automatic applause line and, and will inject a positive feeling in the room. And so that was done very effectively. In fact, I, I thought it was managed well throughout the speech. The content of the speech, I think with a few notable exceptions, was cr quite extraordinary. The speech writers, I think, covered an enormous amount of content and substance. But the, and the president stayed to, to script, as, uh, as the ambassador wow. alluded to. He didn't deviate much. There was a few spontaneous moments. I thought his reference to women and, and emancipation and having more women in Congress was a high point, where everybody got up, including the women in white who were there. Mm. Uh, that, that didn't last, of course, when references were made to late-term abortion. There was a lot of groans, and, and just as there were in reference to the mm -hmm. wall, even some laughter at some points. Well, that was a very... That was a very uh, contrasted experience in Congress, wasn't it? You saw a lot of men on the Republican side standing up cheering, and then you looked at those women powerfully dressed in white this evening. Uh, visually, it had quite an impact uh, sitting on their hands, in essence, Bruce. There's something about a group of white men sitting there making a decision about the, about the treatment of a woman's body and how that should happen in their decision process is not acceptable to most women in the country, regardless of your specific views on abortion, that just this group sitting here making these decisions and standing up and cheering these kinds of things, I think is deeply partisan. I think it's, a, it's really a applause line for his base. And so the fact of the matter is that this is much more technical than he made it sound. He made it sound something very different. You know, if a woman's life is in jeopardy oh. in late term and these right. kinds of things need Bruce, to be dealt with. Stand by. Stacey Abrams has begun to talk. Sounds good. And I'm honored to join the conversation about the state of our union. Growing up, my family went back and forth between lower middle class and working class. Yet even when they came home weary and bone tired, my parents found a way to show us all who we could be. My librarian mother taught us to love learning. My father, a shipyard worker, put in overtime and extra shifts, and they made sure we volunteered to help others. 
Later, they both became United Methodist ministers, an expression of the faith that guides us. These were our family values, faith, service, education, and responsibility. Now, we only had one car, so sometimes my dad had to hitchhike and walk long stretches during the 30-mile trip home from the shipyards. One rainy night, my mom got worried. We piled in the car and went out looking for him, and we eventually found my dad making his way along the road, soaked and shivering in his shirt sleeves. When he got in the car, my mom asked if he'd left his coat at work. He explained that he'd given it to a homeless man he'd met on the highway. When we asked why he'd given away his only jacket, my dad turned to us and said, I knew when I left that man he'd still be alone, but I could give him my coat because I knew you were coming for me. Our power and strength as Americans lives in our hard work and our belief in more. My family understood firsthand that while success is not guaranteed, we live in a nation where opportunity is possible. But we do not succeed alone. In these United States, when times are tough, we can persevere because our friends and neighbors will come for us. Our first responders will come for us. It is this mantra, this uncommon grace of community that has driven me to become an attorney, a small business owner, a writer, and most recently, the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia. My reason for running was simple. I love our country and its promise of opportunity for all. And I stand here tonight because I hold fast to my father's credo. Together, we are coming for America, for a better America. Just a few weeks ago, I joined volunteers to distribute meals to furloughed federal workers. They waited in line for a box of food and a sliver of hope since they hadn't received paychecks in weeks. Making livelihoods of our federal workers a pawn for political games is a disgrace. The shutdown was a stunt engineered by the President of the United States, one that defied every tenet of fairness and abandoned not just our people, but our values. For seven years, I led the Democratic Party in the Georgia House of Representatives. I didn't always agree with the Republican speaker or governor, but I understood that our constituents didn't care about our political parties, they cared about their lives. So when we had to negotiate criminal justice reform or transportation or foster care improvements, the leaders of our state didn't shut down. We came together and we kept our word. It should be no different in our nation's capital. We may come from different sides of the political aisle, but our joint commitment to the ideals of this nation cannot be negotiable. Our most urgent work is to realize Americans' dreams of today and tomorrow, to carve a path to independence and prosperity that can last a lifetime. Children deserve an excellent education from cradle to career. We owe them safe schools and the highest standards, regardless of zip code. Yet this White House responds timidly while first graders practice active shooter drills and the price of higher education grows ever steeper. From now on, our leaders must be willing to tackle gun safety measures and face the crippling effect of educational loans, to support educators and invest what is necessary to unleash the power of America's greatest minds. In Georgia and around the country, people are striving for a middle class where a salary truly equals economic security. But instead, families' hopes are being crushed by Republican leadership that ignores real life or just doesn't understand it. Under the current administration, far too many hardworking Americans are falling behind, living paycheck to paycheck, most without labor unions to protect them from even worse harm. The Republican tax bill rigged the system against working people. Rather than bringing back jobs, plants are closing, layoffs are looming, and wages struggle to keep pace with the actual cost of living. We owe more to the millions of everyday folks who keep our economy running, like truck drivers forced to buy their own rigs, farmers caught in a trade war, small business owners in search of capital, and domestic workers serving without labor protections. 
women and men who could thrive if only they had the support and freedom to do so. We know bipartisanship could craft a 21st century immigration plan, but this administration chooses to cage children and tear families apart. Compassionate treatment at the border is not the same as open borders. President Reagan understood this. President Obama understood this. Americans understand this. And Democrats stand ready to effectively secure our ports and borders. But we must all embrace that from agriculture to healthcare to entrepreneurship, America is made stronger by the presence of immigrants, not walls. And rather than suing to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, as Republican attorneys general have, our leaders must protect the progress we've made and commit to expanding health care and lowering costs for everyone. My father has battled prostate cancer for years. To help cover the cost, I found myself sinking deeper into debt. Because while you can defer some payments, you can't defer cancer treatment. In this great nation, Americans are skipping blood pressure pills, forced to choose between buying medicine or paying rent. Maternal mortality rates show that mothers, especially black mothers, risk death to give birth. And in 14 states, including my home state, where a majority want it, our leaders refuse to expand Medicaid, which could save rural hospitals, save economies, and save lives. We can do so much more take action on climate change, defend individual liberties with fair-minded judges. But none of these ambitions are possible without the bedrock guarantee of our right to vote. Let's be clear, voter suppression is real. From making it harder to register and stay on the rolls, to moving and closing polling places, to rejecting lawful ballots, we can no longer ignore these threats to democracy. While I acknowledge the results of the 2018 election here in Georgia, I did not, and we cannot, accept efforts to undermine our right to vote. That's why I started a nonpartisan organization called Fair Fight, to advocate for voting rights. This is the next battle for our democracy, one where all eligible citizens can have their say about the vision we want for our country. We must reject the cynicism that says allowing every eligible vote to be cast and counted is a power grab. Americans understand that these are the values our brave men and women in uniform and our veterans risk their lives to defend. The foundation of our moral leadership around the globe is free and fair elections where voters pick their leaders not where politicians pick their voters. In this time of division and crisis, we must come together and stand for and with one another. America has stumbled time and again on its quest towards justice and equality. But with each generation, we have revisited our fundamental truths. And where we falter, we make amends. We fought Jim Crow with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Yet, we continue to confront racism from our past and in our present, which is why we must hold everyone from the highest offices to our own families accountable for racist words and deeds and call racism what it is, wrong. America achieved a measure of reproductive justice in Roe v. Wade, but we must never forget it is immoral to allow politicians to harm women and families to advance a political agenda. We affirmed marriage equality, and yet the LGBTQ community remains under attack. So even as I am very disappointed by the president's approach to our problems, I still don't want him to fail. But we need him to tell the truth and to respect his duties and respect the extraordinary diversity that defines America. Our progress has always been found in the refuge in the basic instinct of the American experiment, to do right by our people. And with a renewed commitment to social and economic justice, we will create a stronger America together. Because America wins by fighting for our shared values against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That is who we are. And when we do so, never wavering, 
the state of our union will always be strong. Thank you, and may God bless the United States of America. All right, Georgian Democrat Stacey Abrams giving the rebuttal tonight to the State of the Union address, a Yale-educated lawyer, the daughter of a preacher who ran and lost the race to be governor in Georgia. We are coming for America, she says, describing America as in need of rescuing. Uh, Bruce Heyman, do you think that's right? Well, you just saw, I think, between these two speeches, the beginning of the 2020 presidential race. The president of the United States in his reelection pitch covered the wide spectrum of all the issues out there, but his key word was, we're not going to be a socialist nation. And we heard the second speech where the key words were social and economic justice. And so it's a set of values, and that's what America is going to have to make some decisions on. But this is the beginning, I think, of our 2020 presidential campaign. It's long in the United States, and I appreciate mm. how <laughs> difficult that will be with people announcing. But I think this is the setup. And frankly, I wanted to make one other point back on the president's uh, comments, and sure. I wanted to make it to all Canadians. In my opinion, as the U.S. ambassador to Canada, when I served under the Obama administration and all of my investigation and all the work that I did, NAFTA was not anything in any way, shape or form, uh, the terms that the president used as being a disaster and, uh, and awful and bad for America. Our relationship, in particular with Canada, created millions of jobs on both sides of the border and our trading relationship with Canada was balanced. In fact, the United States had a trade surplus in goods and services. And I think that all the language that the president has used up to this point is wrong in terms of NAFTA. Now, did it need to be upgraded and updated? Sure. But guess what you got? You got TPP, all the work that we had done, plus NAFTA, plus a couple of little minor changes, and that's what we have. And I'm okay with that. And I think this should be passed because it's important that we have this trading agreement. But the president has used this as the, you know, uh, whipping, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to go after, to have a foil out there. The foil is now moved to a wall. And that's where he is. He's now down focused on the wall and all the issues with that. He seems to need a foil. It's moved from NAFTA to this. Um, but. So the risk to USMCA that I heard today mm. was that if he withdraws from NAFTA simultaneously with the implementation legislation for USMCA, that that will be a very hostile act and Congress will not take kindly to that. And I think the risk of, of it being um, kicked down the road or not passed has inc will increase significantly. So I hope he doesn't go down that path. Peter McKay, what does Canada do with this president? Well, that was a very interesting commentary and a positive one from uh, from Ambassador Heyman. I hope that, uh, in fact, I hope he's wrong. I hope they they are able to uh, to find a way forward on this new USMCA. And I, I'm hopeful that uh, what the president signaled it doesn't mean more leverage and and more efforts to connect issues that really shouldn't be connected. Because, for example, well, try uh, suggesting that uh, if he doesn't get his way on the wall, he may not. Uh, Pursue other yeah. other priorities. Or that, cut the investigations. That or, was another thing well, that was on the that's table right. tonight. That's right. There was a lot of nuanced and, and a lot of almost ominous language. But I, I want to just comment briefly on on the rebuttal from the Democratic uh, member Stacey, Stacey Abrams. Abrams. Yeah. I, I thought she embodies, you know, the, the very hope that a lot of people see in America. Yeah. I mean, her her very presence there is incredibly inspirational. She's an incredibly impressive person. Her tone. Uh, throughout was very conversational, very relatable. However, it was, to be fair, very much like an election-style campaign. <laughs> I, I heard the word Republican numerous times and, and some very negative commentary about the president. Now, that's the nature of a rebuttal. And the president had a much different forum and a much different strength due to his office. But it does set the tone, as the ambassador said again, for some very interesting days ahead in terms of the competition. Where does Canada fare in all of this? We had scant mention 
in the president's speech, no mention whatsoever really in the rebuttal, but the references to trade uh, are, are setting the stage for some important work that is yet to be done in the United States regarding that trade deal and its ratification. There was a, a reference that could have gone unnoticed, and that was to missile defense mm -hmm. and an investment further in U.S. military buildup. Yeah. Also, words about NATO. And that's a big, important international institution that the U.S. and Canada and 28 others are a part so of. So what position does that put the Canadian government in right now, particularly our Defense Department? Well, that uh, we need to do, continue to keep pace to some degree in our own investments. Two percent of GDP is the aspirational target set by NATO. But we have to look at North American security. We have to work very closely with the United States on our own border issues. And we have to be in sync, I would suggest, on some of these important issues. That's not to say we don't want you in our house, but we're saying we want you to use the door. As the saying goes, we we want a, a legal system that's fair. Are you saying we could face the same we could we could face the same uh, elect issues during our election this year? Look, Carol, I very much believe that that issue is going to be prominent in a campaign. We're in almost a perpetual election cycle now, mm. and by all means, that issue of immigration, of security, of economic prosperity, some of the the promise and the, and the very useful and and quite effective alliteration that the president did use in his speech. You're going to see a lot of those issues uh, prominent in the Canadian election campaign. So I suspect that people in the PMO were taking a lot of notes from both speeches this evening. Well, it's interesting. You know what? So uh, getting back to what what it, well what you're both saying is. So how do we deal with this country now? Uh, it used to be that we were on side on many issues, if not all. Venezuela, we seem to be on side with that minor difference of whether military options are on the table. Not so minor. But what about the issue of China? What about the issue of Russia? What about multilateral, as you say, Bruce Heyman, about the issue of, of, uh, of, of you know, uh, the potential arms race that could happen? What about missile defense? Where does that leave a country like Canada, our size, who appears to be caught in the middle and not doing very well right now in that position at all? So I think you've got to play the long game. You know, you're 50% through this administration. The large amount of things that he's going to hope to get done will only get done as if he had the Democrats on side. He has an increasing amount of uh, legal issues that he's going to be facing, which will be very much distracting him. Um, and so you have to focus on the things that he will actually be able to get accomplished over the next, let's call it, year, year and a half or so which I think are much narrower now that, that he lost the House of Representatives. Now, one of the things that I predicted earlier, which I was, you mm. know, given word on, was that he would ask for an increase in tariffs. And yeah. he did that very subtly, and it's called the Reciprocal Trade Act that he asked for, yeah. where he could do reciprocal tariffs. Now, what people don't know is that used to be called the Fair and Reciprocal Trade Act, but then they realized the acronym spelled something that they didn't want, <laughs> so they ended up changing it. This isn't going to go anywhere. He's not, he's not going to get these tools and powers yeah. to continue to do these things. It still Where stinks. does Canada go? You've got to play it out with him. You've got to work to try to get USMCA passed. You've got to find paths to, to hopefully, you know, getting the Democrats on side here um, and maybe even some Republicans on side because they have some social issues here um, in, in the uh, in the proposed uh, uh, trade act. So, Peter, okay, Carol, to answer ahead. answer yeah. your question with respect to where does Canada find itself and how do we move forward? We work with America. We work with Americans. We work with institutions, businesses. We work with those who we know are like-minded, yeah. who are the vast majority, I would suggest. And this isn't a partisan issue. But look, I, I have to say this. If it comes to you know, trade diversification, if it comes mm -hmm. to security, we're with America. They're our best friend, they're our best ally, they're our neighbor, they're our geographic partner in, in North America, along okay. with Mexico. And so I, I say the same about right. democracy. And, you know, we, we had a prime minister who said he, yep. he admires the basic di dictatorship of China. I choose America. I All choose right. democracies. And I think that's it. where Canadians are. We have to leave it on that note. Thank you both for joining Thank me you. tonight. I'm Carol McNeil. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Thank you for joining us. From